I'm doing good. Um, working my ass off, keeping busy, and uh, playing together with Transatlantic has been a lot of fun. It's our first time touring in, uh, I guess, nine years now, and uh, we're getting to go to places that we've never played before, like here in Spain. So uh, we're having a great time. We're playing tighter than ever. We're getting along great. We're having a lot of fun on stage. It's a long show. It's almost three and a half hours long to make up for lost time, and uh, the fans seem to be loving it. Well, Transatlantic started over 10 years ago. Neil and I got together for Transatlantic and uh, we were joined by Pete Chouavis, great, great bass player from Marillion, and Royna Stolt from uh, the band The Flower Kings out in Sweden. You know, the vision then is the same as what our goals and drives are now, which is to make classic progressive music. Uh, Transatlantic is not a metal band. It's more about progressive music and classic rock in the vein of, you know, Genesis and Pink Floyd and Yes and the Beatles. So it's always been, for me, about tapping into something different than what I do at Dream Theater. Yes, it's long songs and it's progressive, but it's a different kind of progressive than Dream Theater is. Well, after Neil decided to stop working with Transatlantic and Spock's Beard at the beginning of the last decade. Um, I, I was fearing that we wouldn't work together anymore once he stopped working with Transatlantic, but I was very happy and honored that he asked me to continue working with him on his solo albums. So I did, I think, five or six solo albums with him through the years. Um, and to be able to continue making music with him and having this great relationship together has been uh, an honor and a pleasure for me. He's one of my favorite songwriters in the world. I mean, in, in my mind, he's up there with John Lennon and Roger Waters and Pete Townsend. That's how much his music means to me. So to continue to be a part of it is an honor. Uh, but my role with him on his solo albums and my role with him in Transatlantic are two very different types of roles. With Transatlantic, we're kind of co-captains. With his solo albums, I'm basically just coming in to play drums. I've always ad admired Avenged Sevenfold. I've been listening to them for years, and I've always thought they were great musicians. And I love their ability to bounce from style to style, you know, metal and hardcore and punk and pop, you know, a little bit of everything. And uh, I've always admired that versatility. And uh, the Rev used to always mention me in articles, drum, drum articles and interviews and stuff, so I was always very flattered by that and appreciative. And uh, he and I had exchanged emails and texts through the years and uh, I always told him how much I loved the band and, and always thanked him for always being so enthusiastic about me and Dream Theater. So when he passed last year, it was uh, a shock and a, it's a huge tragedy. I mean, he was just way too young. and. Uh, when the band asked me to come in and, and record the drums on the new album, I, it was an honor. I, I didn't even think twice about doing it. You know, to have been asked something like that under such emotional circumstances for me was, was a great honor. And uh, I went in and did the album with them and it was an amazing experience, a very emotional experience, very heavy um, emotions in the studio with those guys and uh, we immediately bonded and, you know, they're very much brothers, they're very much a family. Uh, not only them as a band, but their, their wives and their girlfriends and their fans. It's all very much like a family. So it was very uh, nice to be welcomed into that family with such open arms. And uh, now I'm going to be able to play live with them for the rest of this year, which is going to be a huge amount of fun and I'm looking forward to it. OSI started as you know, an opportunity for me to work with Jim Mateos. Uh, this was before Kevin Moore was even involved. And originally, um, I had suggested Daniel Gildenlow being involved. So my idea of OSI in the beginning was to do a more progressive metal, Dream Theater meets Fate's Warning meets Pain of Salvation thing. You know, I had done progressive rock with Transatlantic, so when OSI came around, I figured it would be a cool progressive metal uh, supergroup. And, uh, and then Kevin came on board and that kind of pushed Daniel out of the picture. And it kind of pushed me out of the picture as well. 
uh, you know, what, what I was hoping was going to be a collaboration between me and Jim ended up becoming a collaboration between Jim and Kevin. And I was feeling my role diminish, you know, every day more and more, which was frustrating for me. Uh, you know, I was welcoming working with Kevin with open arms. I mean, I really was enthusiastic about it and looking forward to um, continuing a musical relationship with him, but it became apparent pretty quickly that Kevin really isn't much of a collaborator. And I've learned from doing these projects, whether it be Transatlantic or Liquid Tension Experiment, you know, it's all about the collaboration, you know, and uh, with Kevin, he just really didn't want to collaborate. He wanted to just do his thing, and he's kind of very um, stubborn, I guess, or whatever, I, uh, you know, when it comes to his work. So it was very frustrating for me to not be as involved as I had wanted, and, and after a while it started to just feel like I was a session drummer. And then when it came time for a third record, I just, those guys knew that I wasn't interested in that situation. I don't mind being a session drummer. I do, I do sessions with Neil Morse all the time. With Kevin, he's not that much fun. He's a little too serious. And, uh, you know, if I'm going to be a session drummer or if I'm going to work with other artists, I want to have fun doing it. And if it's not fun, then why bother? It really turned more into something completely different than I had ever done and had a real industrial edge uh, with a lot of drum loops and samples. I had no problem with the direction of the music, you know, in fact OSI kind of challenged me to do something different and that's what I, I love when I'm doing different projects is doing different things. I didn't necessarily have an issue with the direction of the music, I just more had an issue of uh, the environment of making it. After we had done two albums together, uh, Jordan Rudis ended up joining Dream Theater, and at that point, it felt to me unnecessary to continue with that project because we were now incorporating that writing chemistry into Dream Theater. Well, right now, there's no plans for any new Liquid Tension Experiment music, but the four of us had an amazing time uh, reuniting for those live shows in 2008. So I think the four of us are all open to working together again in the future, whether it be live or in the studio, it's just a matter of timing and, and the you know, circumstances being right. I did four tribute bands with Paul Gilbert, and uh, all four of them were a total blast. Uh, three of them were mainly tributes that I couldn't really do in Dream Theater. The Beatles, Led Zeppelin, and The Who, uh, those three bands are three of my favorites of all time. Three of my biggest heroes are Ringo, Keith Moon, and John Bonham. And Dream Theater doesn't really tap into those elements as much. When picking an album, you can't possibly please everybody. When we did Metallica and Maiden, the prog fans probably hate it. hated it. When you know doing an album like this, the metal fans are probably going to be bored to tears. You know, um, it's really kind of Pink Floyd in a way, as much as they're one of our biggest influences, they're really the antithesis of what Dream Theater is about. Dream Theater is adrenaline and playing and chops and technique. Doing those bands with Paul Gilbert really gave me a chance to tap into something that's such a big, big part of me and my history. Uh, and then the fourth tribute we did was a Rush tribute, which of course does have a lot in common with Dream Theater. But uh, I just thought it would be a lot of fun to do some obscure tracks. You know, Dream Theater has always covered Rush songs as well. But with my tribute band with Paul Gilbert, it gave me a chance to do some, some of the more obscure, bigger tracks. You know, between the four tribute bands I've had and the four classic albums that Dream Theater's covered, I've covered eight hugely influential bands in my life. Um, there are a few other albums I'd like to cover with Dream Theater, what, you know, bands that are appropriate for Dream Theater, and then there's probably a few other tribute bands I could do with Paul Gilbert, uh, you know, mainly stuff that's not appropriate for Dream Theater. So yeah, I mean, my mind is always spinning with ideas. Uh, it's just a matter of fitting them all into my schedule at this point. Uh, I never got to see Led Zeppelin with John Bonham. Surely that, that would have been incredible. I never got to see the Beatles. I've seen three-fourths of the Beatles. I've seen George, Paul, and Ringo all individually. Uh, 
My parents got to see the Beatles a couple times. Um, another one is Queen. I never got to see Queen, the classic Pink Floyd uh, lineup. And Genesis with Peter Gabriel and Steve Hackett also would have been really cool. But um, other than that, I, th I think I've seen almost every band I've ever wanted to see. And uh, I'm a huge, huge collector of uh, bootlegs, so, you know, I've gotten to enjoy all of those bands many, many, many times over. Uh, a few that come to mind are uh, Roger Waters in 87, the Radio Chaos Tour. Um, that, to me, was as close as I've ever been to seeing Pink Floyd. Uh, Kiss in 77 had a huge impact on me. Um, we played, Dream Theater played some shows with Jimmy Page and Robert Plant back in the mid 90s and I guess that was the closest I've come to seeing the magic of Zeppelin live and I would watch them every night from the side of the stage which was incredible. Uh, seeing The Who do Tommy at Radio City Music Hall in 89. So these are just a few that come to mind off the top of my head. Well, I wouldn't say my house is like a museum. My basement is like a museum. The rest of my house is my wife's, you know, my wife is very much into decorating and having a, a normal, beautiful home. So the whole rest of the house looks like a beautiful home that you'd see on MTV Cribs. But then you go into the basement and suddenly it turns into like the Hard Rock Cafe. You know, it's uh, just memorabilia everywhere and drum sets and autographed pictures and, you know, tens of thousands of CDs and DVDs and archives and magazines and books. So yeah, my basement is definitely uh, like a museum. Yeah, of course, as a drummer, you know, I, I always see room for improvement. I, I wish I had more time to practice like I used to when I was younger, but my life is just very different now. You know, my professional life is so incredibly busy. I'm always touring or in the studio. And then my personal life is so full, you know, with my wife and my two children who I don't spend enough time with it, as it is, that, uh, you know, I don't get to practice drums like I used to when I was younger. And I could see, you know, all of the drummers today are just have these unbelievable techniques, whether they be technical players like Thomas Lang or if they, you know, be, you know, death metal drummers that have this unbelievable speed, uh, you know, all of that inspires me and intimidates me even. Um, I wish I had the time and um, focus to really continue to pursue getting better because I know there's so much more out there, but I am what I am. I'm happy with what I am and who I am and uh, I know my place in the evolution of drumming. You know, I know there's drummers out there today that can play circles around me. And I'm all right with that. I, you know, I'm not trying to be the best drummer in the world. I, you know, I, I, I kind of have a place in the evolution of, and history of drums. And, you know, in the early 90s or so, I played a part in bringing progressive music and metal and all that kind of stuff together. And, you know, it's all evolution. And, uh, you know, there would be no Mike Portnoy if it wasn't for a Ringo Starr and a Keith Moon. You know, evolution goes on. And now there's drummers today that are just taking these progressive ideas and these metal techniques and taking them to whole new levels that are unbelievable and totally inspiring. Well, lyric writing for me, to be honest with you, came more out of necessity than passion. Uh, when Kevin left the band, I felt I would kind of pick up the slack and, and start writing some more lyrics and now through the, you know, the last 15 years or so, I guess I've written a few dozen sets of lyrics for Dream Theater. And I'm proud of what I've written. It's been very therapeutic for me to write, you know, the 12-step the suite and, you know, to have written a song for my father and written a song for my mother with, um, with the change of seasons and also to have written, you know, everything from soft, gentle songs about my children, like with Goodnight Kiss, to angry, hate-filled songs like Honor Thy Father. It's been very therapeutic for me to have all these different outlets lyrically. But to be honest with you, it's not my biggest passion. Um, it's very possible I may not even write lyrics anymore for the next Dream Theater record and beyond. I've, told, I've been telling John Petrucci for many years now, 
you write all the lyrics. I don't, I don't even, I don't feel the need to. I wear so many different hats in the band. That's one hat I could easily just get rid of and concentrate on other things. And I know John Petrucci would love to be the sole lyricist. I mean, I know he loves writing lyrics. So now with my 12 step suite behind me, it's very possible I might be done, at least for now. Well, a lot of fans keep asking for Joe Young to write lyrics, and for some reason, I get criticized think, as if I'm holding him back, but that's not the case. I keep encouraging him to write lyrics. Um, you know, me and John Petrucci together many years ago kind of asked that anybody that writes lyrics in the band kind of bring them in a prepared manner, uh, you, you know, the way that we do. And John Mayung's always kind of brought just kind of loose ends and, you know, Kevin or John Petrucci or myself would have to kind of tie them together and make lyrics out of them. Uh, you know, that's just his style and I would love for John to continue to contribute, but that's for him to decide, not us. No, I feel very fulfilled, you know, I have, uh, I mean, even just this year alone, I'm playing with four different bands and they're all very different from each other. You know, for, I started the year with Hail, which is just like classic metal and thrash, you know, small drum setup, double bass, just full on Motorhead, Slayer, Metallica, Maiden, Priest. That was one side of me. Now here I am with Transatlantic doing something that's not metal at all. It's completely classic rock, prog. Uh, all five of us are singing live. Uh, so this is very much another kind of playing. Then I'll be back with Dream Theater next month on the road with Iron Maiden. That's, you know, Dream Theater is all about technique and, uh, you know, progressive metal and, you know, kind of chops. And then I'm going to be on the road with Event Sevenfold, which is a whole other thing, you know, a, a younger generation and more of today's contemporary metal and pop type of sensibility. So in all these cases, I'm doing different things. And I have a love for so many styles of rock and metal. Uh, you know, it, it could be anything from King Diamond and Merciful Fate all the way to, you know, Radiohead and Muse. And I'm just a fan of good music. And I try to do different things with what I do with my career as well. Strangely hypothetical question because, you know, Hopefully the next Dream Theater record won't be the last, as you're asking. I mean, I, you know, I, I think Dream Theater can be making records for the rest of our lives. Uh, and, you know, every time we make a record, we want it to be the best it could be. And you, it, you never know if it's going to be your last record. So you always want to put everything you've got into it. So whether the next Dream Theater record or 20 years from now, or, you know, the way it's been for the last 10 years, anytime we make a record, we want it to have uh, the three essential in ingredients of progressive, metal, and melodic. You know, we want it to be heavy and have balls and, and be cutting edge with, in terms of uh, aggression and heaviness. We want it to be progressive. We want it to have a lot of odd time signatures and movements and, and um, twists and turns and, you know, stuff that's very epic. And then we also want it to be melodic. You know, we want to have songs that sometimes are soft or sometimes are big and anthemic, but all the time very memorable and hummable and, and melodic. That's always been the formula for Dream Theater, those three elements, and that's not going to change whether it's the next album or ten albums from now. That's going to always be the focus of what we put into our albums. And everything is clear.